Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Don. I'm an alcoholic. If you can hear me, give me a thumbs up. Some wonderful... Well, Jerry, my friend, what a kind, lovely introduction that was that I'm sure I will not live up to. And um, (laughs) you're telling me I sound like I know what I'm talking about. I thought we should go grab my wife from the other room and interview her to that fact. Uh, You might get a different opinion. Uh, But I'm delighted to be here. I see a lot of faces I'm familiar with. Uh, Those of you that know me know that I love Alcoholics Anonymous, and why wouldn't I? Uh, I'm a guy that came to AA at age 31, more dead than alive, and all the hope was gone, the good was gone, all the good opportunities have been missed, all the promises have been broken. Uh, You know, it just, you you can't see this thing coming. And I know we probably have some people that are either new to sobriety or new to Alcoholics Anonymous, or perhaps you're returning to Alcoholics Anonymous with a new sobriety date, trying to overcome your previous experience, and I want to welcome you. And I hope you give Alcoholics Anonymous an an honest try. Uh, It's an interesting thing. There's a little line in the big book. It's kind of a throwaway line, and nobody knows where it's at because it's in the chapter to employers. And the line says this, shouldn't we be more interested in results rather than methods? And that is such a truism for Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, uh, I could talk for hours endlessly about the results of being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, these uh, indescribable, inexplicable little miracles that are sewn through the tapestry of my 30 years of sobriety. Uh, But I don't want to ever forget my reaction to the methods of Alcoholics Anonymous when I was new. And it's understandable why many of us, when we're new to the program, have a hard time swallowing what Alcoholics Anonymous is to offer. I mean, let's take a moment and talk about the raw material that I brought you good people uh, to work with when I was new. What do I really bring to AA as a new man, right? Uh, Belly full of fear, fierce resentment, you know, a satchel of old ideas, pitiful and comprehensible demoralization, the wreckage of my past. I'm at the low point of my existence. Uh, I'm the guy that's described in a vision for you where it says the less people tolerated us, the more we withdrew from them, from life itself. And then it goes on to talk about the chilling vapor that is loneliness settling down, ever becoming blacker. When I read that when I was new, my hair stood up on my arm and I laughed and I went, how did they know? How did they know how done I was with the rest of the world? How did they know how long it's been since I felt real connection with another human being? How did they know what it's like to be in a bar with 100 people around you and feel absolutely isolated? This thing we talk about, this alcoholism, this illness, this malady, this disease, I don't care what you want to refer to it as, I've got it. And it's an isolator. It's a separator. It cuts us away from the rest of humanity, lets us know that we don't fit in, and our case is different, and there is no hope. And the problem with that type of mindset that overcomes the alcoholic, if that's really true, then what's the point of trying? And I know what it's like to hit that bottom of alcoholism, which isn't societal. It's not trips to jail or the horrible financial insecurity or... uh, losing jobs or crashing cars. And all those things may be true in my story, but that's not the bottom for me. The bottom for me was when I gave up, when I decided that I was going to end up dying drunk. And what's the point of even trying? Uh, Because I'm not a guy who came to Alcoholics Anonymous easily. And it's funny where the story ended up before AA because it didn't start out that way. Alcohol was introduced into my life in a real and meaningful way when I was 17 years old. I'll tell you just quickly, I I live in Bellingham, Washington. Um, If you don't know where that is, we're about 100 miles north of Seattle, 20 miles south of the Canadian border. Uh, We're America's first defense against Canada, Lil. You know, I love to say that. And, uh, uh, you know... (sighs) 
I'm sober 30 years. My sobriety date is September 16th, 1991. I got sober in Southern California. Uh, I moved up to Bellingham about 18 years ago uh, with my wife, Eileen, another great sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. She's sober. She'll be 30 years in August. And I've got 10 months more than her, which means absolutely nothing in our house. Trust me, nothing. Uh, but we're having a very good time. And But alcohol was introduced. You know, I was born in L.A., uh, born and raised in Hollywood uh, specifically. And, you know, Holly, it, the neighborhood I grew up in, which was a tough neighborhood, you know, without a father, single mom raising three kids, you know, and it's all, you know, drug addicts and alcoholics and pimps and hustlers and street gangs and you don't have to be raised in one of those neighborhoods to become an alcoholic, but I'll tell you what, it helps a little bit. It really does. It'll, it'll accelerate it. You know, you'll get exposed to some stuff young that maybe some other people aren't, but that's not why I'm an alcoholic. And, uh, but I'll tell you the magic when the, uh, the hook was sank into me, you know, when alcoholism, when King alcohol got its claws in me, that was 17 years old. And if you had told me the trouble I was in at 17, I, I, I wouldn't have known what you were talking about because I got drunk for the first time when I was 17. Now, that's not my first drink. I had been probably playing around with alcohol and other substances for years by that point. But I'm talking about the first time where I got enough alcohol in me in one setting to get there. And if you're an alcoholic, you know where there is because alcoholic alcohol, as much as anything, it transports me. It takes me to the land of I don't care. And that's where I want to live. That's where I want my mail delivered. I love the sense of ease and comfort that comes almost immediately with taking a couple of drinks. And that's right out of the doctor's opinion. And, you know, that's interesting. We don't talk about that a lot. I don't hear a lot about that. But the truth is, I don't have to be drunk to achieve that sense of ease and comfort. A couple of drinks does it for me. And if I could have a couple of drinks and stop the story there, I'd have never ended up in Alcoholics Anonymous. And the world is filled with people that can get a sense of ease and comfort with having a couple of drinks. But they're not alcoholic. They don't have the physical component of alcoholism that I have. You know, I have the phenomenon of craving, the allergic reaction. Normal people, 90% of the population, have a couple of pops and their body says, yeah, we've had enough. We're feeling good. We don't want to ruin this everything's terrific. I think I'm talking too loud. You know, I'm feeling a little out of control and they don't have to go to AA, work 12 steps, get a sponsor, get a home group, sponsor people that won't listen to them. They don't have to do any of it. They just stop casually. I'm an alcoholic. I get a different set of signals when I put a couple of drinks in me. Actually, it's not signals. It's signal. It's one. It's more. And I don't understand that I'm having an abnormal reaction to alcohol. I don't understand that this doesn't happen to nine out of 10 people. So what does that really mean? It means I'm drinking in ignorance, right? So I'm bringing a knife to a gunfight. At 17, I don't know this. I just know that I feel better. And I, I've heard all of your stories. I love listening to people's stories in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know? I love it for identification. I love it, that feeling that I'm not alone. I learn a lot from listening to you. Uh, but we we really do sound the same when we talk about getting drunk for the first time. It's some variation on the same theme, right? I got drunk for the first time at 17, and I, I felt 10 feet tall, and I felt better looking, and I felt more confident. I felt stronger, smarter, better looking, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's all the same. But here's what's interesting. I've noticed sometimes we tell those stories as though it was delusion or fantasy, as though it wasn't real. I'm not sure. I mean, the big book tells me that every man and woman is blessed with certain skills, aptitudes, and abilities. We'll call these our gifts from God, right? These are things about ourselves that we know we're good at. We didn't have to work at them. We were just born with them. And everyone gets a different set of gifts. Some people can play athletics. Some people can do math. Some people are better looking than others. Some people are, have a better personality naturally. And if you ask them to explain why are you like that, they don't know. The guy have always been this way gifts from God. What if those gifts, your birthright, always felt that, well, they were just outside of your grasp, like you suspected they were there, but you couldn't make full contact with them. Something in AA we refer to as what? Potential, right? And then something as powerful as alcohol came into my life. And suddenly, let me tell you something, it's not fantasy and it's not delusion. 
You put a couple of drinks in me at 17, I am 10 feet tall. I am smarter, faster, funnier, more confident, better looking, damn it. In fact, you know what I am? I'm more of what I always suspected I could be, what I hoped I could be, what I dared I could be. Suddenly, I'm in the first time in my life, I'm where I'm at doing what I'm doing, and I don't want to be anywhere else or be anyone else. Completely comfortable in my own skin. That's miraculous. And I didn't understand at 17, I fell in love with the effect produced by alcohol. And it's not any more complicated than this. I like the version of myself with a couple of drinks in me better than the version of myself sober. That's it. And it sounds so simple to try to explain to a non-alcoholic that I sold my soul for the freedom of those couple of drinks. But I never had a couple of drinks because of the physical component of alcoholism. I always overshoot the mark. But I want to be clear about this. It's not like I'm drinking too much early in my drinking career going, oh, I'm, I'm doing bad. Oh, I'm standing out. My drinking has never felt unusual or bizarre to me. I mean, my drinking has always felt necessary and accurate. I've never taken a drink thinking it was the wrong amount at the wrong time for the wrong reason. The drinking I find bizarre is other people's drinking, people that can actually stop, people that look at their watch and say it's getting late and they go home. I don't understand that type of drinking. My drinking feels natural, like breathing in and out. Why wouldn't you have more? I don't understand people when you say, would you like another? They say, no, I'm good. And I'm thinking, no, you're not. <laughs> you're, I'm about to be good, but you're not. And the early part of my drinking is trouble-free, so I don't really understand what I'm in the grip of. It's incremental. We talk about progression, alcoholism being a fatally progressive disease, and I used to think progression meant I drink more, I drink harder stuff, I drink more often, and that's not true. We all, we all drink differently. We drink different stuff with different condiments, the different, you know, we, all our drinking stories are a little bit different. You know, but the progression for me is this. Do you know that there was actually a time in my life where I didn't have to be drunk to have a good time? I mean, think about that. I remember being a young man and all I needed was an athletic field and a couple of buddies and I was joyous. All I needed was to be with some friends making music. I was joyous. In the Pacific Ocean surfing, I was joyous. I didn't have to be drunk to do those things. But by the time I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I had a complete and utter inability to experience joy in a sober state, regardless of the facts of my life. You see, I think that's untreated alcoholism. I think that that's the sober, untreated alcoholism, the definition of that, that takes folks like me, sober in AA, back to the desperate experiment of the first drink. Alcoholism will not allow me to be happy, if you will, in a sober state. It separates me from so many things, from family, from potential, from opportunity. But the big separation is from the experience of joy. And I know that that is hard to explain to people, but I identify with that. It makes sense to me. And that is not something that we can suffer from only when we're newly sober, as though length of physical sobriety has anything whatsoever to do with this ability, this, in, this inability to experience joy that seems to come with untreated alcoholism. I've experienced it at eight years sober, 15 years sober, 22 years sober. I got a little bit of it going on now, to be honest with you. I got some stuff going on in my life that's distracting me, that's affecting my spiritual condition, that's scaring me a little bit. You scare or threaten a guy like me, 30 years sober, you scare or threaten me, my default setting isn't to turn to God. My default setting is to turn to self. I feel like I need to circle the wagons, pay attention, I'm in trouble. Let's be careful here. It's counterintuitive for me to do what AA teaches me, to turn towards this power we talk about endlessly, I choose to call God. But I know what it's like to be eight years sober and all your dreams have come true. You know what I mean? I'm laying in bed. I got a beautiful woman next to me. It's my wife, Eileen. 
I married way above my head. You know what I mean? I got a nice career going. I'm making good money. I'm in the biggest home group in the United States and the world, the Pacific group. And I'm active in that group. I'm secretary in meetings. I'm sponsoring half of North America. I'm doing all the things there. I'm well-respected there. And I'm doing the sober math. You ever done that? Late in bed at night, you can't sleep because your head's chewing on you. And you're doing the sober math. And you're like, hey, job's good. Relationship's good. Money's good. Health is good. Eh. If it was any better, I'd go in the backyard and hang myself. And you don't know what's wrong. You know what I mean? It's like, why am I off the beam? Why do? Why are all these things that before they occurred in my life, I would have identified them as blessings. And today they feel burdensome. What has happened to me? And I think it's nothing more than occasionally I suffer from untreated alcoholism. The problem is the longer you're sober, the stronger the ego gets, the more that we know. And I go to my sponsor and I go, what's wrong? And he says, untreated alcoholism. And I go, that's not it. <laughs> it's the money, the job, the wife. The... What if AA is right? What if every problem I have from the day I walk into sobriety, the day I walk in, what if every problem I have is nothing more than a spiritual dilemma? Wouldn't that be good news? Wouldn't that mean that every answer would have to be spiritual in nature? Wouldn't that really narrow what I need to do to get the ship righted? You know, so many things in my sobriety that I would have identified as a resentment problem or a character defect problem or this problem really is a second step problem. How many things in my sobriety have I got worked up over? It really turned out to be a second step dilemma. Isn't it really that I don't I don't think God can handle it? It's too big, right? Oh my God. I drank until I was 25 with all the things that happened between 17 and 25 if you're an alcoholic and you stay on that path. Trouble comes into my story. Trouble does not get a guy like me sober. It doesn't get real alcoholics sober. It gets heavy drinkers sober, but not real alcoholics. All that because we we get friends. We get friends along the drinking path that heavy drinkers don't get and don't need, that normal people don't get and don't need, but we need them and we get them. And our, our friends are called justification and rationalization, right? I got to be able to go to jail. And when I get out to face my family who loves me, wants the best things in the world for me, I got to be able to look my family in the eye with a smile on my face and laughingly say, well, <laughs> everybody goes to jail once in a while. <laughs> No, they don't. They really don't. I've taught early in sobriety. I used to ask normal people, hey, you ever been to jail? And they would be mortified. They'd be shocked. They'd look at me and they go, of course, I haven't been to jail. Why would you ask that? I don't ask anymore. I didn't realize it's a common occurrence in our society, but unusual outside of our rooms. <sighs> Dr. Silkworth and the doctor's opinion wrote, my alcoholic life seems the only normal one. Through repetition, an exposure to failure and heartache, I will become accepting of a life that really should be labeled unacceptable. I will end up living a life that if you put a normal human being into my life for half a day, they will go running down the street in terror. Yet for me, it had become what? Tuesday, Friday night, Monday morning. When we say our alcoholic life becomes the only normal one, what we're saying is we're living a life that's tragic and painful, yet we think it's absolutely normal because we've just adjusted to the pain. Our capacity to endure every level of pain, physical, emotional, spiritual, I don't think is surpassed by any other group of people. We seem to carry it. And as the load gets heavier over the years, we just bend over under the weight and just keep walking down the road of alcoholism. You know, towards our very own demise, I was the guy walking backwards towards a cliff while everybody's screaming, there's a cliff, <laughs> stop walking. And I got a smile on my face walking towards my own demise. And there's nobody that could have stopped me. And they tried. Frothy emotional appeal seldom suffices. I've had the greatest people in the world, family members, girlfriends, employers, close friends, athletic coaches, you name them, I've had them in my life, and maybe you've had them trying to talk you out of the life you're living, brainwashing you. They brainwashed me before AA, remember that? 
oh, you're such a great guy. You have so much potential. You could be anything you wanted to be. You'd be so happy if you just quit drinking. And it's easy to believe that, right? I lay my experience against it. What do I find? Crashed the car I was drinking, went to jail I was drinking, blew up the relationship I was drinking, lost the job I was drinking. It's easy for me to identify whiskey as the culprit and have this delusion that all I have to do is put the plug in the jug and not drink and all my dreams will come true because I've got that self-delusion about myself. I think I'm a wonderful guy. I just drink too much. I'm sure everything would work out if I just didn't drink. But I have brief periods of physical sobriety, sometimes a week, sometimes a month. Something happens in my life. I crash a car, I go to jail, and I go, this has to stop. And I gather all my willpower, and I actually stop. And I know it's going to be great because you've brainwashed me into believing that drinking alcohol is the problem. So I stop drinking. And guess what happens? It's great for two days. But somewhere between day two and day five, things start to change without my permission. The color starts to drip out of the picture. I start to get irritable, restless, and discontent. My world becomes gray. And I start to think, maybe I made a bad decision with this quitting drinking thing. And that pressure of untreated alcoholism in a sober state just builds and builds and builds. And so one day, a little voice in my head speaks up, and it sounds a lot like me, and it says one word, and it's the beginning of the end. And what's the word? Forever. (laughs) You're going to feel this way forever. And, you know, if that's true, if sobriety is nothing more than the promise of a gray, colorless, no fun existence, I'm drinking tonight. And I got to tell you, when that word would pop in my head, I don't understand. I've just entered into a period of negotiation with the first drink. And if you want to know from age 25 to age 31, those six years, there's a lot that happened. There's trips to jail, car crashes, broken, broken hearts, broken dreams, lost opportunities. But really what happened is there's, I got caught in the cycle of untreated alcoholism where I drink to get sober, to drink, to get sober, to drink, to get sober. And what becomes very clear during this process is I can't stand drinking anymore. I don't want to do it anymore. It's not fun anymore. I get into trouble when I do it. I'm letting everybody down. I wasn't raised this way. This is no way to live. Don't you understand? I have a front row seat for the destruction of my life. But when I'm not drinking, I can't take the pain of sobriety. Well, I'll tell you what, if you can't drink anymore and you're an alcoholic and you hate the way you feel when you're sober, that's a really small menu. Described in the big book is the jumping off place where a guy like me will wish for the end. And I don't do this alone, do I? I do this with my family. My family's watching this. My family's experiencing this. And if you have the misfortune of loving a guy like me who gets drunk to get sober, to get drunk to get sober with those sweet promises that I'm done, I mean it this time, and all those apologies that come with the alcoholic life, you're going to come to one of two conclusions. One, I'm a liar. Right, And I'm not. I never lied when I said I was quitting drinking. I meant it with every fiber of my being. I didn't understand. There's no room for the truth where alcoholism is played out. The other conclusion you might come to is you're not trying very hard. I mean, if you really cared, you'd stop. If you really meant what you said, you'd. I don't think you're trying very hard. Not trying very hard. Who tried harder than we did? I mean, I wake up every morning and it's in the room with me, that thought, not tonight, God, I'm dying here, not tonight, yet I'm drunk most nights. I feel like a puppet at the end of a string. I I feel like I'm possessed. I'm doing things and living in a manner I never wanted to live like, and I can't stop. And who can you talk to about that? I felt like I was losing my mind. And I lived that way till I was 31 And I'd love to tell you, I had a moment of clarity, epiphany. Somebody directed me to AA, and that's not what was going on. It was nothing new that weekend before I came to AA. You know, I I got an unemployment check. I stole a family member's car. I went on a three-day run. You know what I mean? I ended up back at the house. The police are called. I'm interviewed by the police. I was talking to the cops all the time back then, right? But the only thing that was different is my family was going to throw me out, right? And I had nowhere to go. And in a course of begging for another chance, out of my mouth slipped this. I'll go to AA and everything. 
Don't know why I said it to this day. I mean, I know I was lying. I know that I didn't mean I was going to get sober. I know I was just trying to get another chance. But the words that forced me into a commitment to follow through with that first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, where, by the way, my sister drove me to AA and picked me up from AA for my first week, changed my life. We sometimes forget. I sometimes forget how hard it is just to get here. Just to get here. How close I got to not getting here. I didn't want to be here. I wanted the nightmare to be over, but I was also convinced there was no solution for a guy like me. So why would I come to AA? I don't remember my first night in AA. I remember my second night because it changed my life. Uh, And I, you know, you got to have an idea of what I was when I came to AA. I'm 31 years old. I'm living at my sister's house. I haven't worked in a year. I have warrants for my arrest in two counties. Um, I don't have a valid driver's license. haven't had one in 10 years. I have no car. Um, I'm hopelessly in debt. And uh, I'm standing in the uh, Simi Valley Alano Club with hair down the middle of my back and a full beard with food stuck in it. And I'm dirty and I smell bad and I don't shower much anymore. And I'm detoxing from alcohol because I'm physically addicted. I'm suffering from audio and visual hallucinations. I'm wearing my sunglasses at night and I got my tough guy radar out. I'm 6'5", I'm 280 pounds, and I'm daring you to come talk to me. And they're leaving me alone in the Simi Valley Alano Club. And they were wise to leave me alone because I am dangerous, because I'm terrified. And anyone terrified is dangerous. And my head, which, by the way, is where the big book says the main problem of the alcoholic resides mainly in his mind rather than his body. My head started talking to me about you. Look at them. They're clean and they're happy and they know each other. They don't want you here. And why do you do this to us, Don? Oh, you're quitting drinking. Oh, now you're in AA. It's going to be different. Oh, why do you play this game? How many times have you quit drinking? A hundred? And then what happens? You go get drunk and you're going to get drunk this time. You take the pain and then you get drunk. Here's an idea. Why don't we bypass the pain and go get a drink? And I'm telling you, my second night in AA, I'm leaving AA to go get drunk and it will cost me everything. My place of residence, the last relative who loves me, and probably my life, but a small price to pay if I can make the madness in my head stop for a couple of hours. And I've always been willing to pay that price. I've proven it to myself many times over the years before AA, and I caught a break. Because over in the corner were two good members of Alcoholics Anonymous named Lou and Mark. Now, it's the most important moment of my life, whether I live or die is about to be decided, but for Lou and Mark, It was Tuesday, you know what I mean? And these good guys were where they were every Tuesday night between the 6 o'clock and the 8 o'clock meeting of the Simi Valley Alano Club, right? They hung out together. They drank that AA coffee. They told those AA war stories. And more importantly, they had their eyes on the room and they had their eyes on the door and they were looking for men to 12-step. And they did what I believe and took what I believe is the greatest action we'll ever have the privilege of taking in Alcoholics Anonymous They walked across the clubhouse to cordially welcome a new man to Alcoholics Anonymous. And they did it in the kind, unassuming way we're taught to do it. They just introduced themselves. Hi, I'm Lou. This is Mark. We don't think we've met you. Why don't you come sit with us? I'm telling you, that stuff saves lives. And you know why? It might have been 30 feet for Lou and Mark, but for me, it's a million miles, right? You know, do you know where I've been, who I've hurt? Don't you understand? I can't get my eyes off of my shoes. You know, These guys understood the terms of engagement for recovery from alcoholism. They would have to carry the message to the alcoholic that still suffers. And I sat down with Mark and Lou continued to, you know, stand and Lou hit me right in the middle of my back, just clapped me there and said, Don, this is Mark. He's going to be your sponsor. And then he walked away and they assigned me my first sponsor in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I got to tell you, in that moment, my life changed, but I wouldn't have recognized it in a million years if you told me. I just had the most important moment experience of my life. I just said, what happened? I missed it. But here's what happened. I got an active sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous as a sponsor, which means what? I'll be active and sober if I'm willing to have it. Because he's active, he has a home group, which means what? I'll have a home group if I'm willing to have it. He's in the big book. He's working the steps, which means I'll be in the book working the steps if I'm willing to have it. He's got commitments in AA, so he's active. Things that he used to refer to as tethers, things that tied him to the program and kept him from 
floating away on the winds of active alcoholism, right? Which means I'll be active in the program. I'll have little jobs to keep me close to AA. He's got a thousand friends. I thought he knew everybody in AA. I didn't understand when you get a sponsor around here, you inherit all their friends. Now, when you're new, this does not feel like an asset, right? What it feels like is there's a bunch of strangers up in your business. But look at it this way. I, at the low point of my existence, I joined AA. I burned every bridge. Nobody wants anything to do with me. And I meet all of you, right? And in a very short amount of time, you find out everything there is to know about me, good and bad. Yet you still accept me, encourage me, support me, and invite me. Where are you going to get that kind of compassion anywhere else on the planet? And I'll tell you that my sponsor, my first sponsor, man, was a good meat and potatoes AA guy. He wasn't flashy, but he showed up. He showed up every day in AA. And he had his heart and his mind attuned to the welfare of others. And he didn't care whether I got sober or not. What he cared is I was given Alcoholics Anonymous undiluted, that I would understand what AA had to offer and what was required for me to survive alcoholism. And he took me through all three sides of the triangle, right? Unity, service, and recovery, without ever really telling me that's what he was doing. You see, he used the ancient spiritual principle of the invitation to not just save my life and bring me into AA, but to create another AA member. And that was important to him, that we weren't just People that went to meetings, we were members of AA. We were representatives of AA. That if somebody in our neighborhood, at our workplace, on the streets, you know, found out we were in AA, would we reflect well upon our society? You see, I would hope if you talk to my neighbors or the people I'm driving next to on the highway, they would think I was a decent human being. You know, he was a guy who said, don't bring your road rage stories into AA. Grow up. I mean, he was that guy. And he used invitation to bring me into AA. Now, the beautiful thing about the spiritual nature of the invitation is it leaves the sufferer or the invitee with some sense of dignity and self-esteem of the right kind. He'd roll up on me. I'm brand new. I'm at the low point of my existence. I hate myself. And he'd say, hey, I'm setting up a meeting tomorrow night. I could really use your help. And I'd think, use my help. You need me? And I'd say, sure, man, whatever. And I'd show up and we'd set up some little meeting. And at the end of setting it up, he'd shake my hand and he'd go, thanks, man. I appreciate it. I got to tell you, I've been some places. I accomplished some stuff before AA. I don't know why that meant more to me than all of it. And I think I understand why today. The separation that I talk about, about this isolation that alcoholism creates, you know, I felt invisible. I felt like I moved through the world and I, I didn't count anymore. I didn't matter. I felt like I had a shot at a good life once, but that was in the rearview mirror. And thinking the story's over and you come to AA and suddenly these good people in AA start including you, inviting you, and you get to participate in the things that happen, everything in AA you're invited to. You know, it conspires to leave me with a feeling that's this and nothing less. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the story's not over yet. Maybe I have a little strength left in me yet. And you stand just a little bit straighter and you get a little bit of a bounce in your step and you don't know why, but as the days, weeks, and months are going on when I'm new, I'm looking forward to going to AA. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys. It's the highlight of my day. And my life isn't rocketing to stardom. I'm not making money and everybody's giving me big... It's, it's slow variety, not so bright. You know what I mean? It takes time. I took a long, long, my sponsor put it this way. He goes, you lived in active alcoholism for well over a decade, hitting it out of the park, drinking like a maniac and everything that goes with it, right? He goes, you took a long, long, dangerous walk into some dark, dark, dangerous woods, and you're going to have to walk out. There's no shortcut, but here's the difference. You walk in alone but you walk out with us and we're Alcoholics Anonymous and we know the way out. So grab her hand and hold on tight because we don't want to lose you. We lose a lot of them on the way out and we don't want to lose you. And that is the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. We meet the new man or woman where they stand. 
We don't wait for people to get better and then we can help you. We don't wait for you to stabilize. We don't wait for you to have 30 days and then you can work the steps. They got, he got me busy in all three sides of the triangle immediately. He didn't want to waste one moment of my desperation, that desperation of the newcomer, right? Where you're so willing. And he did that with every area. I started sponsoring people at six months sober, which is crazy. I mean, at six months sober, all I could say is, well, I'm six months sober. I mean, I'm still living at my sister's house. I'm, <laughs> I'm working for minimum wage as a laborer on a framing crew. I've never worked with my hands before. I'm horrible at the job. I have a nickname on the job site, the bleeder, right? I have no money. I'm hopelessly in debt. I, I, had, I hadn't even get a driver's license back yet. And I started sponsoring a guy. I couldn't believe it. And I didn't want to sponsor him. My sponsor made me sponsor him because the guy asked me. And I remember telling my sponsor, I go, hey, man, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't want to kill him. And he just laughed at me and went, ah, you got to kill a couple before you get the hang of it. It's like, oh, my God, did you just say that? And he just, he thought everything was funny. He said, you can't kill an alcoholic. He goes, my God, what could you do to him that he didn't do to himself before he got here? He goes, just try to give him your time, his, your attention. That's what we share here. We're not the power. He goes, we're not the well, we're the pipe. If you prepare yourself spiritually, the power will flow through you, but you ain't the power. You're not the well, you're the pipe. And I started sponsoring this guy, and the son of a gun got sober. He's still sober today. He's got six months less than me. I can't believe it. it has nothing to do with me. He took the actions of Alcoholics Anonymous, right? When he got a year in the program, I remember asking him, of all the people you could have asked for help, why did you ask me? And what I think he's going to say is how spiritual I seem. This is what he said. He goes, well, I heard your story. And I go, yeah. And he goes, yeah, I figured if a loser like you could get sober, it'd be a snap for a guy like me. So you never know what the attraction is when somebody asks you for help. Here's the principle. If they think you can help them, you can. If they don't think you can help them, you can't. You can't overcome that. And so I got sober in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I worked the steps, right? And I got the big prize, you know, that the steps tell you you're going to get if you work them. And it doesn't seem like much of a prize when we're new. We're like, what do I get? Do I get a lot of money? Do I get a great career? Do I get a beautiful woman? Do I get this? Do I get that? Maybe they tell you. Maybe. Maybe not. But that's not the prize. What's the prize? Spiritual awakening. That's it. That's it. And it doesn't seem adequate for like what I'm being asked when I'm new in AA. But it turns out that thing that we call a spiritual awakening is the keys to the kingdom. It's the most valuable thing I have in my life. And all it means is this. Spiritual awakening is exactly what it sounds. I was asleep. So what? That there's a power that runs this thing, and it loves me, and it's available to me right now. Now that I know that, I'll never be alone again. Now that I know that, I never have to feel like I have to figure things out on my own. Now that I know that, anything is possible. Hope's alive and anything's possible. Now what's the trick? What do we do once we have the spiritual awakening? <laughs> Don't go back to sleep. And that's what I've been trying to do since I had my first spiritual awakening. And I got to tell you, I have put it on, I have hit the snooze button of sobriety so many times in my sobriety. And you don't mean to, you don't mean to, you just wake up one day and you go, man, I am disconnected. I'm disconnected from my fellows. I'm disconnected from God. I'm disconnected. And that's okay. Because what's interesting about, there's a line in We Agnostic that says, we found that God does not make terms too hard on those that earnestly seek him. Here's another way to put it. He's always waiting. So he's waiting. I mean, that's, that's the third step prayer for me. You know, when I say, God, I offer myself to thee, all I'm saying is, Dad, I'm home, right? Been gone for a long time. I made a mess of it. My life's tragic but maybe you can do something with it, right? That's all I'm saying. I'm home. Give me a shot. Maybe you can make something useful out of me, right? And so I've been that guy several times in sobriety where I've just been disconnected and I've come home and you get back on the spiritual being. And it's God's never shunned me. He's never pushed me away, nor has anybody in AA. In fact, the kindest you've ever been to me is when I needed your kindness the most. 
when I've stumbled, when I fell, when I've had mistakes. And because I'm 30 years sober, you have that wide body of experience, body of work, if you will, sober in IA, which means I've had every success you could possibly have, every joy, every, every blessing you could possibly have, I've experienced in sobriety. But it's a two-sided coin. I've had every challenge, you know, financial reversals and health problems and marital problems. And I've had good, bad, happy, sad, which turns out to be life. It's the grand theater of life that we all get to live. And we all get our turn in the barrel, right? We all get our turn at joy. We all get our turn at heartache. It's part of the experience. But through it all, I did what you people told me to do. You gave me such simple direction. You said, come to AA and bring what you got that day. We want it all. We want the good stuff. We want the bad stuff. And it turns out that we're united and our perfect imperfection of being human. I've never gotten a lot out of people coming to AA telling me how wonderful they are. And they talk about character defects and their, their humanness as though it's a past tense conversation. Oh, I remember when I used to be like that. Let me tell you, I remember when I used to be like that, like Tuesday, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, you want to know how spiritual I am? Catch me on a certain day, you know, ask me, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I think that the greatest spiritual state I'm ever in is when you, if you were to ask me, how am I? And I didn't know because I hadn't been thinking about it. That's probably the height of spirituality for a guy like me when I'm just not thinking about myself. And, you know, isn't that the, the genesis of the, the real beginning the, of the uh, St. Francis principle that we talk about in our 12 and 12, this idea that whatever I want in my life, don't worry about getting it. That's already taken care of. My job is to make sure other people get it. I want to, I want to experience love, be loving. I want to be understood, understand others. You know, I want to be, I want kindness in my life, be kind to others. I want, I want good things. I want to be financially stable. Fine, help other people become financially stable. Everything I want for myself, AA tells me to make sure somebody else gets it first. It's counterintuitive because we live in a world that says me first, you second. I'll help you out as soon as I get mine. And AA goes, no, the world has it backwards. You're in the spiritual world now. Stop worrying about yourself. You're taken care of. Go love somebody. And that's an interesting way to live. If you think that, you know, AA, you know, this thing that we say that AA loved me until I could love myself. Loving myself has never been the problem. What AA did was it loved me until I could love somebody else. And you taught me how to do that too. I'll tell you the most exciting stuff in my life today isn't about me. I mean, I got some great sponsees, man, that have exciting stuff going on in their life, good and bad, challenges and successes. And I just love these guys. You know, I have a home group that I'm an active member on, that I'm emotionally, spiritually, and physically, you know, invested in this group. But the thing about AA I love is the simplicity. You know, we, we, we want to make it complicated, and I think that's an ego-based proposition, right? I, I want to understand God. I want to, <laughs> I want to, you know, I want to be able to talk in a, in a manner that makes it look like I'm spiritually exalted. But the reality is this is a very simple program it, and it is, and, and I'll prove it to you. My second day of sobriety, what do I know about AA, right? And what do you give me? You give me a home group, a sponsor, commitments, fellowship, and purpose. You give me all of those things simply because somebody was willing to take on my case. I'm 30 years sober now. I've never left AA. I've been active the entire time. I've had the opportunity, honor, and privilege of doing everything that you get to do in AA. What are the most important things to me today in my AA life? I have a home group. I have a sponsor. I have commitments. I have fellowship, and I have purpose. You gave it to me on day two. 30 years later, still the, still the great stuff. Still the great stuff. And this is the good news that I think our program carries to our new friends that come here. And this will always be the great news about AA. Alcoholics Anonymous does not work because of the alcoholic. It works in spite of the alcoholic. And that's good news. You don't have to be bigger, smarter, faster, stronger than the next guy to make it here and have a wonderful, wonderful, purposeful, sober life. The best years of your existence actually do lie ahead. I can't wait to see what will happen next. Do I have a problem-free life? Oh, no. 
I got a hundred problems, right? It's like that song, Robert. I got a hundred problems, but drinking ain't one of them. And I'll tell you what, if you're an alcoholic and you've lived the kind of life I've lived and something as magical as AA comes into your life and your main problem is solved, you get to say something like this. Because of my membership in Alcoholics Anonymous, I truly feel like the worst part of my life was over the day I joined you good people. How many people get to say something like that? It hasn't always been perfect, but it's never, ever, ever, ever gotten close to the nightmare that I was living before I came to you. I've been living on the sunny side of the street for a long time now, and I got people like you to thank for it. And I will never be able to repay the gift that I've been given, but I'm going to give it a shot. And I'm going to keep telling people my truth, which is AA is the best damn thing that ever happened to me. And you'd be a fool to miss it. Please give it an honest thanks. I hope you stay sober forever. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.